this is Texas. It's a lot like any other small town, like any other small county. But there's something different here. It's the missing people. For some unknown reason, there are over 40 people missing from Liberty County and the adjacent Montgomery County. Something that the citizens know about and talk about behind closed doors. All these missing people went walking down the road one day and just vanished, never to be seen again. What happened to them? Is it foul play? Accidental? Or something notorious going on? And what about the families? What do they think happened? Finally, after years of documenting the missing from those two counties, I decided to go to each town and talk to the families and walk the same path that they walked before they went missing. My first city was Cleveland, home to missing Larry Baker and Rodney Stokely. Come with me as I visit Cleveland and talk with the family of the missing. In this series, we are researching the Missing Texas 40, a group of 40 missing men and women that went missing from Liberty and Montgomery counties. We have come to Cleveland first to retrace the steps of two of those missing citizens. In this episode, me, Jerry Dean, founder of Missing Texas 40, and Mark, another member of the team, will be in the field retracing the steps of two missing men, Larry Baker and Rodney Stokely. Cleveland, Texas, and we have a full day planned. We're going to talk to Carla. She has had family in Cleveland for years, and she's lived in Cleveland, and she has some things that she wants to talk about and share with everybody. Then we plan to go see Cody Stokely, who's Rodney Stokely's brother, and we're talking to him. He's going to show us where Rodney was last seen. Then we're also going to go see where Larry Baker was last seen before he disappeared. And then we hope to go to the Sam Houston National Forest, which isn't too far from here. And we want to look around that area because I've always kind of had a feeling that maybe there's something there too. And maybe some people have ended up over in that area. So I'm hoping that we'll find all, all kinds of new information I can share with everybody. And so we have a full day plan and can't wait to show you every, everything. All right, talk to you later. Bye. I've never met Carla before. She contacted me on social media when she heard I was going to Cleveland and told me to be careful. I wanted to know why and what her concerns were. I made arrangements with her to meet at the hotel on the day we were beginning our research. My dad uh, grew up here uh, part of his life in Cleveland, actually Tarpon Prairie, uh, which is six miles out of Cleveland going down 321. But, um, and then my aunts and uncles um, lived here as well. Uh, there's always been like this undercurrent. My daddy called it the good old boy system. Mm -hmm. Good old I've boy justice. Before. Good old boy yeah. justice. Um, there's people that have disappeared. There's people that have ended up dead and no one has a clue what happened. Nothing was ever uh, gotten to the really bottom of it. Um, people disappeared. Uh, my whole life I always heard you never want to go to Liberty County Jail because back when I was a kid there was a lot of folks especially if you if your skin color was a little brown uh, you could you could rest assured you were going to get a, a butt whooping mm -hmm. before you got out of there uh, there's always been the uh, same with Splendor which is right down the highway yeah that's where the cloud uh, was with Donna Cloud. She uh -huh. just went missing from there from about a year ago. Uh -huh. And then before it is uh, Patton Village. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my parents lived whenever I was born. But, and Carla also talked about a serial killer. I've heard this before about a possible serial killer living in Montgomery or Liberty County and crossing over to the other county. Could it be serial killer Brandon Laverne? I did a timeline and found the that he was in the area of Montgomery County when eight women went missing. Or maybe it was Israel Keys. His mother and sisters lived in East Texas, who he visited often. Or maybe it was Robert Ben Rhodes, also known as the truck stop killer, who killed 50 people in the early 90s. Or maybe it was someone who's not been caught yet. FBI's former chief, John Douglas, said, 
There are 25 to 50 active serial killers in the United States at any given moment. Since the 1900s, there's been 793 serial killings in Texas. How, one, where's all the bodies? That's one. Okay, why, you know, it's one thing to be a killer uh, and to kill and just leave them, but where's the bodies? So they're either buried or they're in water. Uh, and why take the bodies if all you had in was intention of killing? So you felt the need to hide your crime and leave no, no body. That's one thing that doesn't make sense. So many people and no bodies. Is someone taking them? Our next step was to meet with Cody Stokely, the brother of missing Rodney Stokely. Rodney was only 19 years old when he went missing from Cleveland in 2008. He was walking back home from an apartment complex and disappeared. Cody himself was still in school, but he remembers a lot about the night his brother went missing. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We are looking at the apartment complex here in Cleveland, Texas, at the last location that my brother was seen by another human. All right, and we're t which one is it that we're looking this at? This top one front. This top one right Upstairs there. to the right. And so he left where, about when? It was about 12.30 a.m. when he left. And he started walking. Do we know which way he went walking? Hum Grove is that away. way If you walk down this road until it, it comes to a T, and you can go right or left. If you go left, and you fall it around the corner, it spits you right out on Plum Grove Road, and that's the road that our house is on a few miles down the road where we grew up as kids. Okay, so how about if we uh, take a little drive down the way you thought, think that he probably went and went walking? All right. Okay, all right, that's cool. We're going down the road where we believe that Rodney was traveling we're coming up to Plum Grove Road. There's the apartments in this area. Have we got a bio yet? I haven't been paying attention. Turning left. All right, so this is the cell tower where yeah, Rodney's the last phone. The tower that we picked up his phone when he was traveling down, walking down Plum Grove Road back to our house. The very last one he picked his phone up before his phone shut off. When Before he left that night to, to go, he tried to find his charger and I couldn't find it. I tried to help him find it and uh, 
I had to go to school the next day, so he ended up telling me, just go to bed, don't worry about it. You know, I don't want you to not be able to wake up for school in the morning. I'll be back later on tonight or first thing in the morning. And that's when his phone died on this tower right here. Gotcha. This is Rodney Stokely's house that he lived in before he went missing. There's no one that lives in the house right now, and the family moved out shortly after Roddy went missing. Right here is the skateboard ramp that he and his brothers used to play on all the time when they were growing up. Right behind me, with the traffic noise, is Plum Grove Road. And this is the road that Rodney and his brothers traveled down as they were growing up. After my brother went missing. But my parents always kept it because they didn't want my brother Rodney to ever come home and come here and then the house, we sold the property and someone tore the house down or there's a new house here and he's like, what happened to my family, you know, where right. all these people around here know us and know that we still own this property. So they moved into town, but it just got too bad out here and now you saw they're building that new highway that used to not always be there that was uh -huh. all the woods there's a cemetery back there and EquiSearch actually searched all that area and you would think if they would have found anything when they were building that highway tearing up all that dirt and you know they would have seen something anything but uh but yeah this is this is where he was headed whenever he uh whenever he didn't make it back this is, this is where he's heading right here do you have any theory I mean, or a lot of theories. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, you know, over the time. You see, this is a curvy road. It, somebody could have been drinking and driving and accidentally hit him and they're just scared to go to jail and they did something. I mean, I mean, it just, the list goes on. I've heard, you know, all kinds of stuff that he uh, might have been in bad with Aryan Brotherhood. But you, there's no, you were very close to him. If there was any Aryan brother stuff going on, I think you would have known something, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, we were. Nothing I, changed with him. No, he I seemed the four, same the whole time. I have, there was four of us, and we were all really close, so we all knew everything about each other. That's why he told us where we was going, you know. And not a family that wasn't close, he would have just left and yeah. gone. But he told me, hey, I'm going to this party. I'll be back, you know, tonight or in the morning. I can't find my charger. My phone might die. So. I mean, he would have told us, and if he would have left and done something, the one person he would have told is my mom. He would not have left and gone anywhere without without at least letting my mom know, because me and all my brothers were close to my mom, but him and my mom have a real, real tight bond, so he, he would have definitely let my mom know, but nothing, you know, changed in his attitude or how he was acting. He was worked full-time at Monday Chevrolet with my mom. He was just about to start a college classes at Kingwood, because he was only 19, you know, he had just graduated high school. He was about to start classes, and... Uh, so when all this happened, he was uh, um, three weeks to a month shy of getting off probation. So he didn't, you know, run to get away from the cops or nothing right. like that. And, and um, so, I mean, everything was going good. You know, he was, he had gotten a little trouble in high school making some uh, counterfeit money. He didn't, nothing serious with it. You know, he just got caught with a fake bill and got in trouble with it. And he was on probation and he was about to get off of probation mm -hmm. within the next three weeks to a month whenever he came up missing. What about how, how do you feel the support from the local law enforcement? Um, at the beginning, you know, it uh, Texas Equal Search came, and you know the local law enforcement, you know, they came, and uh, but I mean, definitely not, you know, something that they would, you know, would think that they would put more effort into it a, a missing persons case, you know, not something that just how can a case be cold? How can a case be considered a cold case if there was really never any investigation or you know, talking to people and getting out there in the first place, how can you make a case cold when you've never done anything for it to become a cold case? So I definitely think there there could have been a lot more help and not even help, maybe more publicity, you know, getting the word out there. Uh, whenever it happened, you know, I mean, you can talk about it all you want, you know, months later or years later, but when it's fresh, you know, that's when right. whenever it should be talked about. And did, did they ever have any search dogs come out? Um, Do you remember? Not, not with the police department. I, now Texas Echo Search, yeah. they might have had some of their search dogs. And that would make we sense. Had people on full wheelers and. How long after did they come out after Rodney was gone missing? Oh, that, that following weekend. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and All they, right. And they were here for about. They came like two or three weeks, you know, straight, like two or three different weekends straight, and we set up command post on uh, North Cleveland at a church um, one time, and then we set up one at Pace Dancel at the where they have like the rodeos. Uh -huh. Park in Cleveland, we set one up there, and so Texas Equal Search definitely, you know, helped us all they could, you know, on, on their part without being actual law enforcement, you know. But they they really did seem to, to 
to help us a lot. And uh, I just found out in the past two days that uh, the lead detective of my brother Rodney's case, Sergeant Lasco, Detective Lasco, is not even with the with the county anymore, or not even working on my brother's case. You know, but no one called you know my parents or me and said, "Hey, Sergeant Lasco's." you know, not with the department anymore, he's not on your case, this is the new detective or new officer on your case. I actually found that out through work. Um, there's a guy with the sheriff's department came, named Ken DeFore, and he uh, he came into my office, I want a flooring company, he came to my office to get some flooring and he started talking. And I always keep the Texas Echo Search flyer on my desk at my office every day, all day, and, and he seen it and we got to talking. And he actually worked on my, my brother's case with Echo Search when they first, he's not an investigator, he's on the, uh, like the reserve side, he hires the reserves officers. So he's not an investigator, but he helped with that. And he's the one that actually told me that Lasco's not even with the department anymore and working on my brother's case. There's a, a new huh. officer, but we don't know his name or no one's- I haven't heard of anything. Person. Has anyone tried to contact the sheriff's department and find out who the new investigator is? I just found this out on Thursday. Oh, did yeah, you? Yeah, okay. I mean, I just, right, he so just came into my office. Yeah, you. I just found this like within two days. I mean, okay. it all happened. He came in and he saw the flyer and. He saw what he my name was familiar and we started talking and one thing led to another and that's where that's how that got on that. But yeah, he was telling me that he's with a new department and not on my brother's case. As we were driving around town we spotted a sign on Plum Grove Road near where Rodney Stokely and Larry Baker lived. On the stop sign you can see someone spray painted an ass on it. We can only find one gang that used the NS tagging and they were located in Canada. But further research showed that gangs will use directional descriptions like Northside and abbreviated as NS. Is that what NS stood for on the stop sign? The Beaumont Enterprise reported in 2010 that there was 225 documented gangs in Houston. Captain Brown said in that article, it was a national trend that the gangs were moving from the inner cities to suburbs to rural areas and there was no part of Houston or the surrounding area that didn't have gang presence. Cleveland is 45 minutes away from Houston. My name is John D. Carter. I'm a former Dallas police officer of six years. I'm originally from Liberty County. My brother is Rodney Stokely, who I believe is one of the missing Texas 40. And that is one of the major reasons I became a police officer was that event. Um, the only theories I have surrounding the missing Texas 40 is going to come down to the drug trade that occurs uh, involving both the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican cartels that are entrenched in Liberty County uh, in dealing with heroin, methamphetamines, and prescription drugs. Uh, there is a lot of violence that occurs uh, with these two groups that goes unreported. I took a picture of Cody standing on his family's porch and he began to tell us about another missing person, Larry Baker. A good old guy, he called him. A guy that Rodney and Cody saw all the time as he worked at the market up the street from their house. Hi, my name is Jerry Kenner. In 2010, my brother disappeared from Cleveland, Texas, Liberty County. This is a picture of my brother Larry Baker who disappeared in Liberty County in 2010. He had a neighbor disappear in 2008. This kid also knew my brother and went to the store where my brother worked. Rodney and Cody would see Larry Baker at the market at the Exxon Station on Plum Grove Road often over the years. He was working there when Rodney went missing in 2008. Rodney was thought to be walking on Plum Grove Road, heading home when he went missing. Although Larry was no longer working at the Exxon Station when he went missing because of his health, he did live just down the street from there on Briars Oaks, a quick five-minute walk from Plum Grove Road. We're traveling down CR 325, which is, runs right alongside the Exxon where Larry Baker worked. We're looking for, take a look at this.
Briar Oaks Road. Behind this trailer, you'll see one that's sitting sideways. That was the trailer that Larry Baker was living in before he went missing. Walking from here to here would have been impossible for Larry. Although Larry used to walk from his home to the market all the time, with his health and infected toe and the rainy weather, it is unlikely he would have made it to the store that night. Add on the fact the store closed at 10 p.m. There was no reason for him to walk there. Larry's roommate said he went to sleep, and when he woke up, Larry was gone. So where did Larry go? Did he walk to the mailbox, or to the back of the property into the woods? Or did he walk all the way to Plum Grove Road? The following day, we went to the Sam Houston National Forest. If there was a serial killer around, certainly this would be a perfect place for them to go. What we found were no rangers and everyone keeping to themselves. Right now we're in the Montgomery County area of the Sam Houston National Forest at a little campground. And it's 96 degrees. And it's 96 degrees. Not too many people around right now. Our last stop was the Cleveland Police Department. Because it was Sunday, we didn't expect too many people to be there, and we were right. Other than a couple of squad cars, it seemed pretty quiet. After spending two days talking to people who would consent to go on camera and many more that would not, I felt like I had a better understanding. The people I met were exactly as I hoped they would be. Their sincerity compared to their hopefulness. When you're looking for a missing person, hope is so important. Although many people I talked to warned me about the dangers of the area, there was only one time where I felt afraid. No one seemed to pay attention to me, and it was actually the camera with the windscreen shotgun microphone that got more attention. As we drove back, I thought about the family of the missing. I realized that the one thing that keeps them going is the hope that they will one day know what happened to their missing loved one. Not because of curiosity, though, but because they want to bring them back into the family fold. Remember what Cody said? His parents never sold the house because Ronnie may come home one day. That's it right there. That's what makes grieving families of the missing different. Every day they hope their loved one is found so they finally know where they are. That intangible feeling of knowing that your missing loved one is out there somewhere, whether dead or alive, and not with a family, is what tears them apart and also keeps pushing them forward. You know that your family member would go to the ends of the earth to find you, and that's exactly what you're going to do for them. Michael J. Fox said, Family is not an important thing. It's everything. No one knows that better than the family of the missing.